Hey, it's me, the Quenchies. I'm that late afternoon craving you just can't shake. Wait, what's that? Welch's Grape Aid? No! Made with real fruit and no added sugar, nothing answers the call of the Quenchies like Grape Aid. Got the Quenchies? Grab a Grape Aid in your juice aisle. ABC Wednesdays. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raises, too. I'm Honey. still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with a new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary, Wednesdays, 9.30, 8.30 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. What up, y'all? It's Joe Budden here to talk about prize picks. Prize picks is the best place to win real money while watching football. You can get up to 100 times your money. Prize picks will give you $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code SPOTIFY. That's code SPOTIFY on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play a $5 lineup. Prize Picks, run your game. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Hello there, folks, and thank you for listening to the show. I'm Joanna. And I'm Nate, and we are Stranger Than, a podcast discussing unsolved mysteries, weird occurrences, misunderstood phenomena, and creepy happenings. Today we're going to talk about the infamous D.B. Cooper. Yes, and hopefully everyone has had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving is kind of D.B. Cooper time. It is. It was November 24th, 1971, sometime in the afternoon, where... A man calling himself Dan Cooper purchased a one-way ticket to Seattle, Washington from Portland, Oregon. Did you know it cost $20? $18.56 or some shit like that, yeah. It's funny, it's so crazy. So he slapped a 20 down. Got some change back. <laughs> Got some change back for his airline ticket. It was Northwest Orient Airlines flight number 305. And uh, November 24th, 1971, that would have been the day before Thanksgiving that year. Because, Thanksgiving Eve. Yeah, because, you know, Thanksgiving's on a different date every year. It's always the, the same Thursday. But it's one of those fucking holidays where the date changes on you. Easter. Easter. Fucking Easter. I mean, Thanksgiving, at least, it just only shifts a little bit, depending on what the third, you know, the fourth Thursday of the month is. Fucking Easter's Easter all over the goddamn place. is just all over the goddamn place and is such a hassle because sometimes it's like you have more time to prepare for Easter, as in like shit with your kids, and other times you have less time and oh my god, it's just a fucking, it's like when's Easter going to be this year? I think it's up to the Pope somehow. Yeah, he just throws a dart at the calendar. <laughs> so Cooper was dressed in a black business suit with a black tie and a white shirt. He appeared to be in his 40s and he just... Patiently waits for the flight to take off in the back of the plane, sipping on his bourbon and soda. And he was wearing mirrored sunglasses. At first, he wasn't wearing the sunglasses. He did pop the sunglasses on after the whole thing. Right. So, I mean, I mean, he right away after they take off or something, isn't it? Is when About he gives 10 minutes. The, yeah, when he gives the... Because the fucking flight's only like 30 minutes. Yeah, shortly after 3 p.m., Cooper hands the stewardess a note that says that he has a bomb in his briefcase and she needs to sit with him. So the stewardess sits down and Cooper opens his case, revealing a bunch of wires and red tubes, and has her write down his demands. Cooper has the flight attendant take the note to the captain, which demands four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills. And the stewardess's name was Florence Schaffner. And $200,000 in 1971 is, in today's currency, over a million dollars. Is it? I was wondering because it just seems like such a low number. Oh, I was yeah, like, no, I wonder what that was worth in 1971, but $1, I didn't $218,859.26. Jesus Christ, that's a lot. It's that's a, a lot of money. I mean, that's crazy how much inflation has occurred in like 40 years. Oh, yeah, shitload. That... 200 grand is now like then it would be like over a million dollars now oh yeah you could it's crazy so the flight lands in seattle cooper allows the passengers to leave 36 to leave florence schaffner also gets to leave but uh tina mucklow is the other stewardess that was on the flight that has to 
is going to be going and making that second trip with Cooper. So he gets the money in the parachutes, and with just four members on board, he orders the captain to fly to Mexico City. Did you know the money came from Seafirst Bank? Do you remember yeah. Seafirst yeah. Bank? I had. I think I that was one of my first bank account. Yeah, weren't they? T- I think they were taken over by Bank of America. Yeah, they were. Okay. Shortly after 8 p.m. between Seattle and Reno, Cooper jumps out of the rear of the plane with parachutes and the money. To this day, the FBI does not know who this man really was. So that's just, that's the basic Mm -hmm. story. We're obviously, that's it. Thank you, folks. Have a good night. (laughs) Don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That was just the basic story, but we have, there's a lot more to it than that. First off, the name D.B. Cooper, as opposed to Dan Cooper, was, according to the FBI, a myth created by the press. It seems it was more of a mistake and not really like a thing they did on purpose. A mistake was made by a class. Well, there's a couple accounts. Um, One version is that Clyde Jabin, a United Press international reporter in Portland, Oregon, uh, he was the only one in the office at the time the hijacking occurred. He didn't even hear about it until the plane had already landed in Seattle, heard about it over a police scanner or something like that. So he starts making phone calls, trying to figure out what's going on, and he gets a hold of an FBI agent who told him the suspect's name was D. Cooper. The story goes that Jabin asked the agent if he said D as in dog or B as in boy, and the agent just responded, yes, that's right. And so he assumed it was D. Oh, so that's how it turned into D. B. Cooper, because I I know that it had been reported somewhere like mistakenly that it was db cooper but i didn't know where that probably where that report source came from yeah so it was just sort of a mix-up on the phone Mm -hmm. the other theory is that the fbi were investigating a man whose initials were db cooper in portland and he was not the suspect but his name was in fact db cooper and then the initials were leaked again to the upi and there's no internet right now basically they broke the story and that's how it stayed yeah, um, well, been... and it was more catchy, too. Catchier than, like, Dan Cooper. D.B. Cooper is, you know... Just rolls off the yeah, tongue better. Yeah, just rolls off the tongue better, so even though it was kind of a mistake, it's like, you know what, let's just let's just keep it that way. Gives him kind of a, a certain mystique. You know, mm-hmm. he's just got those initials, one of those initial names. Well, and just the fact that, yeah, there's the whole mystery, because he still has never been found. And... Right, they, you know, some of them really think of him as like this big criminal mastermind, while others want to kind of like put him down and say like actually he wasn't all that smart. So, but well, he got the, the away DB, with it. The DB Cooper part kind of like um, supports the theory that he was this kind of almost debonair criminal mastermind who who got away with it. Yeah, especially with the suit and everything. DB Cooper is like his success name. <laughs> <clears throat> Wednesday, November twenty fourth, nineteen seventy one. The day before Thanksgiving, a man who says his name is Dan Cooper spends a whopping 20 bucks on a one-way ticket to Seattle from Portland. As most men who are on airplanes at this time, you know, they weren't wearing sweatpants or anything like that. They were Well, it was still a little bit classy to be flying in an airplane and they gave you nice drinks and they probably didn't even fucking charge you extra for the goddamn... I mean, nowadays it would be $20 just for the fucking airplane drink. Yeah, no shit. (laughs) <laughs> so he's just if he would have dressed any other way it would have been he would have stood out so it was the black suit the black tie the white shirt had the sunglasses and the suitcase the tie he wore was a jc penny black clip-on tie with a mother of pearl tie clip recent investigators have found titanium on the tie after putting it under an electronic microscope 1971 titanium in the pure form was quite rare that means that Cooper may have worked in a titanium production facility or a chemical plant. Since the metal was found on the tie, it meant that he wore the tie to work. So likely if he did work at one of these places, he was a manager or an engineer. Boeing had been working on a project using titanium shortly before the hijacking. So he could have been employed by Boeing. Mm-hmm. It's believed that because of his knowledge of how the plane worked and how to operate a parachute and how to manufacture the bomb, if it was actually a bomb, he was probably an engineer. Right. In addition to the titanium, there's other rare earth metals that have been on the found on the tie. So he could have been working in an advanced metallurgic foundry or was a lab technician or something like that. Or maybe just stuff, stuff randomly got on his tie. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're around other people that have that, maybe they got it on his tie. 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like he can pick up a lot of microscopic shit anywhere. So it's a poss- It's one of those things. It's a possibility, but I, th- I feel like they like really like like to hype it up. Well, there's like, so little. There's so little to go evidence, to, to so. go on. So any little clue is just kind of like, oh my god, it's, what a breakthrough! Clue is yeah, huge. what a breakthrough! But yeah, it's so like it, it could be a breakthrough clue, but also it could just be like he just had some random shit on his fucking tie. Yeah, or yeah. some accumulated there over. I mean, the thing is like forty fucking years old. No shit. No shit. And has been and in knows? FBI lab and FBI hands. I mean, maybe it came yeah. from the fucking FBI fucking lab FBI or whatever. FBI smudged some, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when they were fucking doing some shit. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. So this is flight 305, one way, Portland to Seattle. It's a 30-minute flight on a Boeing 727 FAA registration N467US. He boards the plane and takes a seat. He sits on either 18C, 18E, or 15D. Regardless, he took a seat, lit a cigarette. You know, it was the 70s. Oh, yeah. You could smoke on the plane. Wait, what do you smoke? Like Regals? Those were the brand of cigarettes, I believe. I didn't I didn't look into the brand of cigarettes. Regal cigarettes. Regal cigarettes. They did a whole profile on the Regal cigarette smoker. Like, you know, oh, I see. He's like kind of like your above average classy man. Gotcha. Like, <laughs> gotcha. I'm like, did this come straight from the like the tobacco company? <laughs> You're right. It probably did. I think so. Like we can't really make commercials anymore, right. so we'll just <laughs> And so he lights a cigarette and orders a bourbon and soda. Because he's just fucking cool like that. That's right. And it's weird that it was only a third full because it was the day before Thanksgiving. So you'd think it's a big ass travel day now. but Right. I guess flying just wasn't like still as popular for everyone. 20 maybe. bucks was a lot of money. Well, and I think probably it was, I don't know, even, even with the massive inflation, it's probably cheaper than it is now, but... Probably Still, you got you got more you got your money's worth a lot better I think you, you had leg room yeah you, you had leg smoke. room you got to smoke you got to drink probably didn't charge extra like it had like nice meals and yeah yeah got to check all your fucking luggage for free and they roasted peanuts right there on the plane <laughs> <laughs> oh it's just you know it would have been fun to fly back then but I don't know I mean Portland though. You think, I mean, a lot of people are just going to drive from Portland. Oh, yeah. Because you know, I would I would actually would be... have to have some extra pocket. Cl- if I needed to get to Portland, I would totally drive rather than fly. You go to Portland all the time to play shows. Oh, I know. Just be like, oh, I think I'll just fly this time. Well, if I was going to hijack a plane, I would definitely fly. <laughs> it's hard to hijack but a plane still, from a, like, from a... you know, not everyone's going to do that. We're talking about why the plane is only a third yeah. full <laughs> yeah. the day before Thanksgiving. And that might be one reason because people are just like, no, I'll just drive from portland to seattle oh, especially cool. because there wasn't all that tra- traffic back then. oh my god so Can it's you imagine? insane now well this 250 <laughs> flight was again only a third full maybe there just wasn't that much going on between seattle and portland back then <laughs> either could be yeah well not long after they took off about 10 minutes cooper handed a note to the flight attendant florence schaffner she mistakenly thought it was just another note from some businessman trying to get a piece of ass. Because that was also totally like, okay. like Probably oh, hey, happened all hey, the time. Stewardess. There's a reason they have the stewardess fantasies was because, you know, it was kind of a little bit different back in the day. Yep. Well, she apparently isn't into that because she just drops the note in her purse and doesn't even look at it a second time. She's like, oh, Jesus, fuck. Some other fucking guy all like, oh, hey, you're, you're beautiful. Cooper then leans close to her and quietly tells her, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. The Damn. Note... <laughs> yeah. That would get my attention. Yeah, yeah. The note allegedly said, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me. You are being hijacked. Apparently, he also said, and no funny stuff. No funny stuff. Yes, because I've seen some of the trans... Don't try any funny stuff, hey? There's no funny stuff, see? <laughs> whoa all right no funny stuff all right we got it no tomfoolery i've seen it said that he took the note with him yeah that's what i heard too well there was actually two separate notes because there was a note he wrote to that he gave to her saying that they were being hijacked 
And then there's a note that he gave to the pilot saying what his demands were. I thought that he had her write down his demands. Possibly. That's but he, what but I you know, thought. either way, there was like two notes. There were two notes. And but... he took both of them with him. Oh. He asked for the one back that he gave to the pilot, too, with the list of demands. Smart. Yeah. Of course, he left his cigarette butts there with yes. his DNA all over it. But, you know, you didn't really know about that at the time. That's right. <laughs> you didn't realize that that was kind of major. So that probably wasn't the exact wording. But according to the flight attendant, the gist of the note was basically just that. So Schaffner sat next to him, and he opened up his briefcase, revealing six or eight red tubes, some wires, and a battery. In exchange for all the passengers and most of the crew, Cooper made the following demands. 200,000 in 20s, which is again over a million bucks. Four parachutes, so there was two primary parachutes and two reserves. Basically, two, two parachutes, because each... There's set. like two, they, there's like, yeah. Okay. Each set is one. One in a backup. One. So yes. He also wanted a fuel truck to be in Seattle when he got there. Schaffner went to the cockpit and informed the pilot, William Scott, of the situation, who informed Seattle, who informed the police. For the authorities to get all the shit ready for Cooper when he landed, they needed a little time. So the plane just circled SeaTac for a couple hours. So longer than it took for them to get from Portland, they're just flying around up there. Now, the reason that the other passengers were told for this was a minor technical difficulty or that there was a lot of air traffic. Even though all the air traffic had been diverted from this area due to, you know, the hijacking that was in progress. Mm -hmm. During this whole thing, everyone was pretty chilled out, though. Cooper had a couple more drinks, just sat in the back, put on, had put on sunglasses at this point smoking cigarettes most of the other passengers were unaware that anything was even amiss so they were just doing regular passenger stuff right so he was pretty you know like low-key yeah he's totally low-key the crew they knew shit was going terribly wrong and they pretty much just were low-key too so well it's because i mean even though it was fucked up and being hijacked i mean he didn't instill a lot of panic with his behavior yeah he wasn't being a dick mm -hmm. he was just like no funny stuff see <laughs> the airline handled the two hundred thousand dollars they got it from several local banks the fbi of course took pictures of all the bills to record the serial numbers originally four military parachutes were obtained from the cord air force base which is pretty close mm -hmm. but upon hearing this cooper declined those and demanded civilian parachutes instead they were obtained from a local skydiving school owned by Earl Cossey in Issaquah, Washington. He had gotten the call from a friend of his that worked at SeaTac. His friend couldn't say why, but he needed two chest mount reserve parachutes and two backpack parachutes. So Cossey called the drop zone and had the person there hook the police up with the parachutes. Two of the three parachutes had been packed by Cossey himself. The fourth one, one of the chest mount ones, was a grounded training model. It would not have deployed. It was sewn shut. With a giant fucking X on it. Right. Like, I, I'd heard about that. But then why did he... Did they only give him two of those four, though? Or did they actually they, give him all four? They because gave him all four. He had demanded four, but not really four separate parachutes. He was. He demanded two reserves and two regular back mount ones. Okay, so, so he, he, had two he, did, he did want two, four separate parachutes. Because I was thinking... Well, the parachutes were two back mount. And mm -hmm. then the reserve parachute, you then strap to your chest. Right. And that way, if your back one doesn't work, you've got a reserve parachute. See, I thought that it was all in like one was your backup and your reserve so that you didn't, it wasn't like two separate parachutes. Oh, no, it's two. It's two separate parachutes. So that's why they say there's four parachutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had. Because Mr... there's like some controversy over like the, the parachutes that that Mr. Kazi packed. I say Mr. Kazi because. I had him as a teacher in junior high. Yes, this is an interesting fact. This is like a weird hometown twist to all of this, is that he was a teacher at the junior high that Nate and I went to together. I was, in, junior his, high. I was in his air sports class. So I, we made like model airplanes and those rockets that you'd light off and shit like that. I actually didn't have him for anything, but I remember he would uh, parachute into the into the field on Lion's Day Oh yeah, every the, year. Yeah, sort of that festival that, day. Yeah, it was like the la you know, the second to last day of school and you basically just got to like hang out and do nothing. Get your yearbook signed and what have you. Yep. A little bit more about Mr. Cossie later. Right, but yeah, there is a lot of like weird stuff around like what parachutes cuz I I 
heard on one source there was the training one, but then there's another thing about they, they don't even mention that one was training that the other one is one where there was two separate pull cords he would have had to use. Right. And might not have known that and that he had packed it that way on purpose. And I didn't read anything like that because the shoots were already like Cossie wasn't the person to physically give them to the police. Right. He'd packed those three shoots. He had packed them a long time knowing. before the crime. So but, there's no way he would have done anything untoward because he wouldn't have known. Right. It might have been, though, that he had it modified himself for other reasons. But That's true. Yeah. Basically, Earl Kazi did not think that D.B. Cooper would have survived the jump because of the the one that he would have had to pull, the one and then the other, and that he might not have known to do that in that particular shoot. So. I'll be damned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to getting the ransom demands, the FBI was also looking into the who the hell Cooper was. They weren't able to come up with anything about him at all. There's actually a Franco-Belgian comic book character called Dan Cooper in a series called Les Aventures de Dan Cooper. It's about a Canadian Air Force ace and a rocket ship pilot. It's all fictional, of course. And I oh, guess of course. it hadn't been <laughs> yeah, of course. And I guess it hadn't been translated into English at the time. So, it's not so it's not a non-fiction comic book it's no it's fictional. not one of those non-fiction comic books <laughs> yeah it's interesting why he would have picked that that name like because i'm gonna assume that dan cooper the one that he wrote in on his ticket because you know 1971 oh yeah not only to get all the fucking cool drinks and shit like that and your fucking airline ticket is 20 dollars uh, you also don't need to, like, show your ID. No. Nope. You didn't have to go through any kind of screening. Like, he brings a fucking bomb in a suitcase. Whether it's functional or not, like... No one even opened his fucking suitcase. No one even fucking opened his suitcase. Or and anything. You, there was tons On domestic of, flights, you could just... You could have anything on you. There was tons of, I guess, sky piracy that happened back in the day, too. Constantly. Jesus. It was crazy. Yeah, it took a while before they are like, okay, I think we... You know. It took until 9-11 before they were finally like, okay, maybe we need to be a little bit more hardcore about this whole flying thing. Right. Like, I mean, a lot of stuff changed after that. Oh, yeah. But even prior to 9-11, I mean, they did finally like instill like metal detectors and having oh, yeah. to have your suitcase, yeah. you know, go through the x-rays. But back then, I mean, that wasn't even a thing. That wasn't even a thing at all. You did not have any part of you like looked at or scrutinized Anything you to didn't even declare? Have, yeah yeah nope nothing to declare you don't even have to show your id nope nope write a fake name down with a bomb write in the suitcase. a fake name down with the bomb in your goddamn suitcase so yeah dan cooper that's the one he picked for whatever reason at 5 39 p.m the plane finally lands at seattle tacoma international airport just 15 minutes after cooper had been informed that everything he wanted was in place as the plane was landing, the Cooper told the pilot to land it in a well-lit area of the tarmac and had them either dim the lights or lower all the window shades in the cabin so he could not be sniped. Who knows what the other passengers thought of all this window shade closing nonsense, if that's the way. Like, trays up, shades down. Right. The deal was that one man would bring Cooper the cash and shoots. He brought Cooper a roughly 21 pound, which is 9.5 kilograms, knapsack full of cash, and the parachutes. Flight attendant Tina Mucklow had been tasked with lowering the stairs and ret retrieving this stuff, which she did. No one really knew what Cooper was planning to do. Did you know that uh, it was all $20 bills? All $20 bills. Yeah, which so is that, why that's, it was the... That's he pretty heavy. Yeah, I mean, 23 pounds? 21. 21. 9.5 kilograms. 21 pounds of money. That, that's quite a bit because, you know, I get like reams of paper for the printers at work and like 500 sheets and it's probably only like five pounds or something but i mean it's heavy right you if i had to like hold four of those at a time i would be huffing and puffing trying to lug around like 20 pounds of paper it's fucking heavy well tina muckler was able to do that well maybe she with worked the parachutes out she too. seemed <laughs> yeah the parachutes i'm sure were heavy as well way so, to go tina yeah so Clearly no one fucking doing her yoga <laughs> I think it was more than yoga. Boxing. Kickboxing. It's Kickboxing. Fucking... There you go. Kickboxer. Authorities expected that the reason he had demanded two parachutes was that he was going to bring one of the crew with him. So they wouldn't have grabbed the dummy parachute on purpose. 
Right, just because in case. that that could have been the one strapped to the fucking exactly. So did they know that it was a dummy? So they they're asserting that they didn't know that the training parachute they had put yeah, they in didn't was, know. And was I don't not going to work because it's got a big fucking X zone on it. But well, I mean, why would why would that even get? Wouldn't the person who packed it know that? And when they're handing it off, like, oh, like let's not take that one right the person who worked at the actual right landings drop zone like oh yeah it. like let's not give him the one that has the giant fucking x on right it. i don't know i don't know what the hell i don't know why or how i mean that makes no sense right not at all but you know whatever uh, anyway whatever nobody nobody ended up having to go with him which is fortunate like that that would have been fucking terrifying be like, okay, now I'm gonna jump out of this fucking plane, and uh, you miss. You're gonna come with me, like, right? Get your fucking parachute on. Like, have you ever like, done this before? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> Jesus Christ! Mucklow walks down, and she hands him the parachutes, and she hands him the bag of cash, and so he allows the 36 passengers to leave. All the crew, excluding pilot William Scott, co-pilot William Radizak, flight attendant Tina Mucklow, and the flight engineer. H. E. Anderson. He's got a fancy mm-hmm. initial name. There were some problems refueling the plane, or someone was being a wise guy. Uh oh. One version says Cooper grew suspicious as to how long it was taking to refuel and voiced this, and then shortly after complaining, the fuel crew completed. The like, yeah, guys, you better hurry the fuck up here. <laughs> Another version says that the first fuel truck had a problem, so they had to bring in a second. And then it ran out of gas, and so they had to call in a third to fill it up completely. You know, that doesn't surprise me. It is still the fucking airport. I know, right? And then some jackass <laughs> from the FAA wanted to get on the plane and <laughs> tell Cooper how much trouble he was in. And Oh, my God. Cooper didn't let him get on the plane. Like, like no. I'm Mr. So-and-so from the FAA. Right. And I just want to let you know. <laughs> you are in a lot of trouble, mister. Yeah. This is very inappropriate behavior. Finally, at 7.40 p.m., Cooper and the four crew members are taking off from SeaTac on a southeast course towards Mexico City via Reno, Nevada for refuel. So, that was the plan? I, I had heard that maybe they just said that they were, they were just going to go to Reno as the final destination. He had wanted to go to Mexico City, but yes. they were like, yeah, we fucking can't do that. We don't have the Well, fuel. the reason that they needed to go to, in, in, to Reno to refuel was because he stipulated that the cabin was to remain unpressurized. Mm-hmm. They are not to exceed an altitude higher of 10,000 10, feet, yeah. which is just over 3,000 meters. Well, I think that's one of the maximum, you know, you can't jump from higher than that, I don't think. It's also It's also not too high that a person can't I don't, can't I don't pretend to breathe. be an expert on uh, jumping out of fucking airplanes. I, I have no idea what the actual cap is as far as how high you can be up. The reason behind it was since they weren't going to pressurize the cabin, that 10,000 feet is as high as you can breathe normally. Oh, I see. Without needing the cabin to be pressurized. That's right. If it's not, then all the fucking like oxygen shit falls down from the... I don't know if they had those at that point. I don't know either. This, I have no yeah, fucking they idea. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, had fucking their Boeing 727s, which is what this plane was, yep. had fucking like rear stairs, which was uh, kind of an oddity for um, a commercial airliner. And they would just, you know deploy like anyone could just fucking like open up the goddamn oh, yeah. exit yeah. to the plane as we will get into in a few minutes in here. just a minute here actually yeah so no higher than ten thousand feet so they can still breathe normally right they're also not to go any faster it's anywhere from 120 to 196 miles per hour which is 190 to 315 kilometers an hour depending upon sources they vary for some reason mm-hmm. all sources however do say that this is close to the 727 stall point he also had to fly using just manual control with the landing gear down and the flaps at 15 degrees. Right. And he wanted the rear stairway down during takeoff. Needy, right? Mm-hmm. But this was the final like, straw. Actually, this is what, you know, I'm going to need this. And, you know, he's like one of those guys at the restaurant that orders like everything, but have it all fucking made differently. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> or the guy at the co- the, the lady at the coffee shop who goes in and out. Oh, right. 55 instruction long cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, this was the final straw because Radizak, the co-pilot was just not going to take off with that stairway down. Yeah. He adamantly refused. And Cooper argued about it for a bit, but ultimately gave in. He was just going to open it in flight. 
He reviewed the instructions for the rear stairway with Mucklow. He claimed it could be done. She didn't think it was possible. It's kind of weird. He just, what do you think, Miss Mucklow? Yeah. You think I can like just open up the bottom of this plane and that's going to be cool? Now, all of these very specific requests about how to operate the plane suggests that he's pretty knowledgeable about the Boeing 727. As I said before, McCord Air Force Base is super close to Seattle. So they have a couple of uh, jets yep. trying to fly with them and shadow them, except that they have to circle around because of how slow the plane is going. They were a couple of Convair F-106 Delta Dart all-weather interceptor aircrafts. And they were trying to keep above and below and mm -hmm. kept having to circle around yeah. because they were going super slow. They'd even diverted a Lockhead T-33, which is a training jet, to trail along after all of this shit. And it followed them until it had to turn around because of low fuel near the Oregon-California border. After takeoff, the crew had been ordered to remain in the cockpit. This was 1971, so they didn't have any sort of closed-circuit television. And for some reason, there was not even a peephole in the cockpit door, so they had no idea what was going on in the cabin. It has now been 20 minutes since the 727 took off from SeaTac, and a red light goes on in the cockpit. It indicates that the rear, aft, stairs are open. Now here's customer service. Captain Scott intercoms to the cabin, asking if there's anything that he can do to help. I mean, that's... Right. You know, it's their fucking hijacker. And he's like, oh, do you, need, do you need a hand back there, sir? Well, maybe he's just offering the hand so, like, you know, he doesn't end up making everyone fucking die somehow. That's probably the case. <laughs> it's like, can I help you with that, sir? Like, can we not have you messing around with, like, the fucking doors to the airplane? Yeah, and... We're in flight, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's something I can help you with. What's up, guys? It's the champ, Sean O'Malley, here to talk to you about prize picks. Prize picks the best place to win real money while watching football. Run your game on prize picks. Prize picks will give you $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Just download the prize picks app and use code Spotify. That's code Spotify on prize picks to get $50 instantly when you play a $5 lineup. Prize picks run your game. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Well, being the problem customer he is, Cooper curtly declines. Mm hmm His declining words were the last anyone heard from the man who called himself Dan Cooper. He jumps out of the plane, alone, wearing loafers, a black suit, a light rain jacket, the knapsack full of cash. And Which, a... supposedly, he might have tied around himself with parachute cord, because I he... think that's the last thing Tina Mucklow had to go back last to the cockpit. She was with him for a little while, but she thought she saw him as he ordered her to leave and she was walking away that he was bent over and starting to like wrap something he, around himself, like the bag of money. He had, yeah, he had taken apart one of the other parachutes. Right. At SeaTac that day, the temperature was around 35 degrees, just two degrees Celsius with a wind chill and light rain showers. And that was just on the ground. So jumping out of the plane, you're looking at negative 70 Fahrenheit, negative 57 Celsius. It was just as cold near the Oregon-California border, but without the rain when the T-33 turned back. Plus all that wind. Yeah, well, the wind chill, like I said, negative 70 is Jeez. fucking cold as shit. That is really fucking cold. That is, you know, especially if you're only wearing a goddamn business suit. And a light, just a light rain jacket, like windbreaker style, I'm imagining. Right. It probably wasn't even like North Face. No, I don't know if that existed in 1971. <laughs> Between 8.13 and 8.24, the plane responded the way a plane responds when a person jumps out the back of it. But the crew would later estimate that they were at the southern tip of Washington State when he jumped, an area spanned from Lake Merwin to 20 miles, 32 kilometers, north of Portland. Nothing I read says anything about Cooper being concerned with the crew talking to authorities or anyone else over the radio. This whole time, they are talking to the ground. Right. In fact, you can find the transcripts for the whole exchange between Flight 305 and the ground. That's interesting. But they still don't take a look out of the cockpit to confirm whether he's gone or not. I mean, I get they're afraid, but they didn't land in Reno until 1015. So two hours of where they think old Dan the man had jumped. But they're not 100% sure that he's gone. He hasn't been a dick to anyone this whole time, mm -hmm. with you know, except with that surly reply about the aft stairs. So for two whole hours, you don't even take a look. Maybe you have the captain start talking over the intercom. Maybe he opened you, up the door really slow, like, gonna, yeah, yeah. just take a little peek there. Like, 
you know, like when you're a kid and you're like trying to be super sneaky and I mean, you're just like slowly turning the door knob. Yeah, totally. And like ever so slowly pushing that door a little bit at a time till you get like the tiniest crack you can see through. I mean, they didn't employ that. Exactly. Yeah, I can and do that probably. I mean, I can do it like slowly, but like, you know, I mean, maybe like th- over 30 seconds. Exactly. While the inner, while the ca- you captain's get... talking on the intercom mm-hmm. to kind of distract and to make exactly. to make noise exactly. so that you can't hear the creaking of the door if the door isn't well oiled or whatever. Right. So. But they didn't. No, they did not. They did, however, land safely in Reno, though. That's right. And, and discovered he was not on board. He was not. So he probably did jump when they the plane responded the way that it responds when someone jumps out the back. The only things they found on the plane were his was his clip on tie. With the mother of pearl tie pin, and then the two of the parachutes, the one that had been cut open, and then the one that the the other front load one that wasn't the dummy one. So somehow, for some reason, he took the dummy parachute with him. So that was one of the ones. That was the one with the big probably X that he sewn was. On it. That was the chest mount one. Okay, so that one was likely on his chest when he jumped. That's right. So I don't know. I don't know why that happened, but. But he also had a back one. He did have a back one, so he was going to get down just fine. The chest mount ones are backup parachutes. If your back one fails, then you've got another one because, okay, you know, it's better to have an extra parachute kicking around and not need it than you did plummet to your death. It. Yeah, plummet to your death. That sounds fucking awful. Doesn't sound fun. No. Have some time to think about the plummeting stuff. and the splattering. Right, right. I don't that think awaits. it would be like that's not cool. No, I don't think it would be nice. I don't think it would be nice either. I mean, at least the the actual death part would be fucking quick. That would be fine. Like that's but, that's uh, one thing that's that has an appeal to it. I mean, it's 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 messy, but it's pretty instantaneous. You don't have to say. clean it up. So <laughs> if you do, then you've done something very very wrong. Right. Now the search is on, focused mainly around this Lake Merwin a little ways southeast of Ariel, Washington. It ended up encompassing Clark and Cowlitz counties. Have you ever been to Ariel, Washington? I have not been to Ariel specifically. Neither have I. Yeah, I've been through southern Washington quite a few times. So the FBI and local sheriffs are searching the area by foot, by air, by water, and going door to door, but they don't find shit. Right, because like there's so few people that actually live in that area the door-to-door part was probably the easiest because there weren't that many doors and it's like oh yeah i know that guy and oh hey what's up sheriff that's right yeah it's probably like fargo kind of like that you know just a little bit i mean that is pretty remote area Mm -hmm. much more than the you know grand metropolis of fucking seattle down there it's it's very sparse yes the fbi also had planes flying the flight path of the 727 looking for any signs of cooper and didn't they have, like, they didn't even have, like, their own planes. I, I feel like there was one of the helicopters from, like, Weyerhaeuser or one of their planes was one of the search planes, like, looking around. Like, they had the help of, like, local businesses. Right, like, whatever they had around. Right. It was probably a smaller agency back then. I mean, mm-hmm. didn't have as much funding. and. Well, and back then, okay, so, I mean, Seattle is, like, really blown up. In the last couple of decades. Yeah, since like but the it, 90s. Right, but yeah, but yeah, but, the whole tech boom, Microsoft kind of kicked it all off. But prior to that, you were kind of like out there. It's the when Wild you, West still. Right. So Seattle wasn't even like a huge city. And so when you're living somewhere like far from Seattle and, you know. You're even farther out. You're even farther out. Even now when you go down there, there's like hardly anyone fucking living out there. But 1971, it seems like it would be so... Significantly fewer. Yes. It'd be, it seems like it would be so dis- just out in the woods. Just not a lot of people. So the FBI, they had their planes flying around on the flight path. And they did find many pieces of plastic and broken treetops. And they investigated those, but... Nothing ever came up. Didn't it. turn up anything there. What else would be breaking treetops? I don't know. But there was enough places that they had several that they had to investigate. But then again, investigate. we're in remote Washington state. I mean, it's the goddamn Evergreen state. Yeah, who knows? Could be anything. There's lots of trees out here. Maybe they just broke because there was a bunch. I mean, right. That's what I'm saying. There's I mean, like so many fucking trees. It's, it's like, like oh, well, like, tops. look, there's a few broken ones here out of like the eight fucking million 
that are around. In mm. Lake Merwin, they sent divers because they saw this white thing floating in there, but it turned out to be nothing. I don't know how they see a white floating thing and it turns out to be nothing. If you want to see something enough. They send divers. They're like, I don't know. There was nothing there because they didn't say, oh, it was a refrigerator or whatever. They just said it turned up nothing I'm like, OK. They also the FBI recreated this whole thing. The, the whole Cooper leaving the plane. They put a 200 pound sled in the rear of the plane. They had the pilot fly it the same way he did before. They that's so funny that that's how you have to recreate something back in the 70s. By actually recreating it. By actually it. recreating yep. it, not just using a bunch of like computer projections. Nope, they just... As to, oh, it was this degree with this, with, you know, and this it weighed this much. Oh, well, this is the path it would have traveled on this particular night, you know, with, under these temperatures and conditions. It's like conditions. one of the guys had just got a new refrigerator and they needed to get rid of the old one. He's like, well... Well, we can use my fridge. Right, so and and Scott, the pilot, confirmed that it felt the same way when they pushed the sled off as it did when what he what they had felt when they assumed that Cooper jumped off. So this this for them was confirmation. So I, that, I don't think it, it was a sled, right? Yeah. Because now I can't stop thinking of it being it's a refrigerator. It's a refrigerator. <laughs> the fucking parachute. On it's it. just a, <laughs> no, they didn't put a parachute on it. They did. They just. They didn't care about that part. They just wanted to see what it felt like when they pushed it off. Oh, weird. Because okay. he jumps off. I thought off. they were trying to like recreate like. I mean, well, I guess, like where he's gonna fall and shit. See now you too. got. See now you got me in the whole refrigerator thing because I'm thinking they don't want the refrigerator back, but it was a sled, so they probably wanted the sled back. So it's possible they did put a parachute on it. Well, sleds are cool, like. 200 pound sled is a heavy fucking sled that is a well-made sled I that think is it's, like a wooden sled with like metal I don't, pieces I don't it's think one it's, of them really nice sleds i don't think it's one of those kinds of sleds i think it's the kind of sled that's just used you don't to, think like, it's like a crate. rosebud sled <laughs> no i think it's like a kind of sled that like hauls crates around sort of like a pallet jack kind of like a pallet like jack pallet sled kind of that's what i think it would be no it's like a rosebud sled it's like a treasured sled it's a refrigerator. I like refrigerator. <laughs> I like refrigerator with parachute on it too. That almost okay. Image wise, it makes me think of like I Dream Genie. Like remember the opening credits? It's like it's like a cartoon, and there's like oh, yeah. Larry Hagman, and he is in the parachute part of the spacecraft when it does that thing with the parachutes. I don't remember it that well. Okay, well you know how it does the thing with the parachutes, anyways. When you land, when you come back to Earth after you've been out in space. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like the little like beaker looking triangular ship and then it has the three parachutes that let it fall gently back to earth oh i see yeah totally okay so that's what i'm thinking in my head like with for the refrigerator the, okay like, okay well, there's the refrigerator it does probably doesn't have three parachutes but it has one parachute one parachute yeah we'll, falling we'll back go to earth through the trees of washington it was a sled but we're gonna call it a refrigerator because it's more right. fun it is more fun to push a refrigerator out of an airplane i mean jesus christ if you're gonna fucking push shit out of an airplane May as well be an old refrigerator. I think an old refrigerator is pretty awesome. As long as you're sure it's not going to fall to earth and smash somebody. And out in that part of Washington, that's pretty good chance it's not going to hit anything it's besides a tree. It's probably going to break some the tops of some trees. Yes, that's that's why all the treetops are broken, is people <laughs> dropping fridges from airplanes. That's what I'd like to think. Like, that was like a thing to do. Like, they have, they have the planes from the locals anyway, and they're like, you know what we like to do on the weekends? I bet this could help you out. Why don't we try pushing a refrigerator off? It's just something we like to do, and I bet you that would solve your problem of trying to figure out how it felt when he jumped off. Inhabitants of Ariel, Washington, if you're listening, send us an email. <laughs> StrangerThanPodcast at gmail.com. And let us know if you <laughs> like tossing refrigerators out of planes. But this test was enough for the FBI to consider it confirmation that they were searching the right area for Cooper. The initial search lasted for three weeks before being called off. On Thanksgiving, which is the day after all this happened, they searched national crime records to see if he had actually used his real name. The following spring, FBI, Army soldiers from Fort Lewis, the Air Force, the National Guard, and volunteers conduct an 18-day ground search of the area. They did this in March initially, and then another 18 days in April. The only thing of note they found was a body of a teen who had been abducted and apparently murdered a few weeks previous. Jesus Christ. So 
hear at all about that. Yeah, they found they found a body. So that's, that's really crazy, considering the area that you were in at the time, that they were in at the time. It was good they found the body. It was good that they found the body. I'm sure, I didn't look into whose body it was, but I'm sure someone's happy that, I mean, not that there's a, that they're well, a body now. Well, they but... at least have some closure and find out exactly. what happened. But it's just odd, because you're talking about, like, yeah, no people have heavily wooded. That's why they're not even searching again until spring because Oh man. It you just can't access and get through that stuff. No, and down there the there's probably snow and it was mm-hmm. the seventies and it snowed a lot more back in the day. I remember it snowed a lot when I was a kid and it yeah. barely snows now, so I can only That's imagine weird. before I was born it probably snowed even more. Right. So it's just it's just odd that that's what they uncover is like some other like random murder. So yeah. it, it probably d- didn't happen a lot out there. Not a lot of people. Yeah. It's just so, a numbers game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're There's not, not a lot of people. Lot of you're not going to get a lot of murders. The fact that you're in this really remote area and finally it's like thawed out for s- spring and you can go looking for something else. And then you find like another, like a completely random murdered person, teenager. Yeah. That's, that's kind of crazy, but no DB Cooper, no DB Cooper. No sign of him. No, they they called in a marine salvage firm called Electronic Explorations Company, and they actually had a submarine, and they took a submarine and searched Lake Merwin. Wow. Turned up nothing. And Lake Merwin, does that, that feeds into the Columbia River, is that right? I don't know. Okay. Later, Scott, the pilot, would say that since he was flying manually, it's possible the flight path was further east than they had been searching. Another pilot, who was a few minutes behind the hijacked 727, says that the wind direction would have been a major factor as to where Cooper landed, which I'm sure everyone knew because it's... Well, it's it's a fucking parachute, right? you know, like, it just seems like those things would be susceptible to wind. wind Yeah, totally. (laughs) The direction of the wind and blowing of the wind and... This new suspected area is near the Washougal River. I probably pronounced that wrong. And after a 1986 book was published, it was also thoroughly searched mainly by civilians, but nothing conclusive has been found. It's also possible that the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 may have destroyed some evidence as ash covered pretty much that whole area. Mm -hmm. So, you want to be a marketer. It's easy. You just have to score a ton of leads and figure out a way to turn them all into customers. Plus, manage a dozen channels, write a million blogs, and launch a hundred campaigns all at once. When that's done, simply make your socials go viral and bring in record profits. No sweat. Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. But with HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools, launching benchmark-breaking campaigns is easier than ever. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. In November of 1976, the FBI realized something very important. They hadn't charged Dan Cooper with anything yet. And so before the statute of limitations was up, they got an indictment from Jack Gore Collins, an assistant U.S. attorney in Portland, against John Doe, a.k.a. D.B. Cooper, for hijacking Northwest Flight Number 305. They probably could have gotten around the statute of limitations. Probably. Because he did a whole bunch of other, I mean, there was a bunch of other shit that they could have gotten him for, but it was funny that they'd forgotten to charge him and they, it took them until 1976. So it took them five years to figure out, oh, shit, we better charge this guy. Well, you usually don't charge somebody with a crime before you even know who the fuck they are or find them. That doesn't seem like a weird thing to me. Yeah. Like, but that once must you be know, some weird loophole. I mean, okay, you... so federal, so hijacking a goddamn plane only has, like, a five-year statute of limitations? Oh, I'm sure it doesn't have a statute of limitations Well, then anymore. why did they have to, yeah, well, no, but I mean, it seems like it shouldn't even then. Well, it was, no one had gotten away with it. I mean, there had been several plane hijackings, skyjackings. Right. Five months later, this guy um, hijacks uh, up an airplane from the Salt Lake international airport and he demands five hundred thousand dollars oh shit in cash so that's about a that's over two million of today's money exactly two and a half million or so wow that's a lot nothing to scoff at that's for certain yeah i mean i could probably go you know if you go especially you go to some like third world country 
to live out the rest of your life with like two million in cash. Right. I mean, hey, you're set. You're totally set. So this guy also hijacked a 727 and parachuted out from the aft staircase. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, so he did basically the exact the same thing, thing. But they must have caught as him, right? D.B. Cooper, yes. And he parachuted over Utah and landed and was like, totally cool. His mistake was that I guess he had bragged to somebody oh. that he could do just like D.B. Cooper. He could pull off the same stunt, except if he had been D.B. Cooper, he would have asked for half a million dollars and not just 200000 Right, right. Yeah. Like, oh, so by today's standards, like, I would have asked for two million, two point five million instead of just a million. So go bigger, you know, fuck off. Right. So that guy's name was Richard McCoy. Richard McCoy. So because Dick of that. McCoy. <laughs> so because of that bragging or whatever, the FBI shows up at his house. He was a he was a pilot in Vietnam, had a wife and two small children. And so they show up at his house in Utah and they find the five hundred thousand dollars in the house. Right, I mean, right. it's pretty like cut and dry. This is the guy, and initially they arrest him on suspicion of both. Oh, why wouldn't you? Yeah, because, I mean, it was so similar and just five months later. And and it makes sense to escalate, you know, ask for mm-hmm. more money the next time. Be like, yeah, this time I'm going to ask for 500 grand. Let's see if I can see if I can get that much. But they didn't find any evidence whatsoever that it was D.B. Cooper. I believe I actually did read about that briefly, and he had an alibi for that particular... Right. Night. Like, I mean, it was it was pretty obvious. It was not the same guy. Did so the same was... crime and, and actually was uh, seems a little bit more successful than D.B. Cooper. If you believe that D.B. Cooper is fucking dead. Right. Well, yeah, definitely. I... <laughs> <laughs> if he's dead, then you anyone's more successful. Well, because I mean, this, this, he's, either people think he's dead or people think he's alive and got away with it. Right. Kind of thing. So if he did actually die, then. Obviously, this guy did it better. I mean, Utah, that's, there's a lot less trees Yes, in but Utah. it's still a pretty harsh environment, or can be, because... It can be, but it was April. Still. April in Utah, most of the places are pretty fucking warm. Really? Because yeah. Because they snow early. It can snow, but it is warm in Utah by April. Utah is generally a warm state, like, all over. Well, remember, kids, don't brag about your crimes. Right. Or don't commit crime. That's an even better piece of advice, I would think. Okay. (laughs) Well, by 1975, none of the $200,000 had showed up in circulation. Not one bill. A few counterfeit bills with serial numbers from Cooper's ransom bills had popped up, but none of the actual bills had surfaced. How long is a fucking serial number on a piece of money? Like a $20 bill? I don't know how many digits long the number is. It's alphanumeric. It just seems very odd that that would be the counterfeit number. It would be a number out of the ransom paid to. I know that is kind of weird. It is. It's a weird coincidence. I mean, what are the chances of that? I don't know. Maybe they knew about the serial number. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like they were recorded. So maybe somebody was like, let's use these serial numbers. But that seems stupid. That seems like a good way to get caught because. If you know those are the serial numbers that you have recorded for the fucking ransom that the FBI is already fucking looking for. Yeah, no shit. Like, oh, it's like, let's make some fake money with that same exact serial number. No, that seems like the dumbest thing you could possibly do ever. If you're And if you're smart enough to be a fucking counterfeiter, it just seems like it's just a weird coincidence. It is a weird my co- coincidence. Opinion, and, not, and just not something that a criminal would probably be apt to do. In November of 1978, a man hunting deep in the evergreen wilderness mm-hmm. came across something one rarely finds in nature a plastic sign and it was a plastic sign from a 727 stairwell it had did it say exit on the sign i don't know what it said on the sign this had come from flight number 305 a few months later in 1980 in the spring an eight-year-old boy on vacation with his family on the columbia river near vancouver washington which let me tell you it's a shitty fucking place for a vacation before March. Oh, yeah. Anywhere in Washington. I mean, even all through March and most of April. It's really not nice out here in Washington until like maybe like mid-May you start getting some sunny days here and there. It's warmer 
it's light out longer that it it's nice but it still doesn't really consistently stop fucking raining until like july well this kid had been set to the task of digging a fire pit so on his hands and knees smoothing out the sand with his right arm this is on the banks of the columbia river yes he comes upon three bundles of money right beneath the surface his uncle thinks they should burn it but instead they brought it to the authorities why would you try and burn muddy money uh, probably because he thought that it was a bad, like, oh, this is some bad shit. We found it's like a some ton drug of cash, money. right? A ton of cash in the middle of nowhere. Like, I would sketch too if I was, you know, it was the seventies. Who knew? Who knows? It seems like you. It would be even more innocent though in the seventies. Like you wouldn't be so much like, oh my god, clearly, like I'm gonna die if I have this money. Who knows? But he like wanted... I would feel that way one hundred percent now. Like if I fucking come across some like huge amount of cash, like I'm fucking calling the cops. There's no goddamn way. Not I'm even gonna... touching that money. I'm not even touching that shit. Like, yeah, nothing good will come of that. That is for sure. Well, I'm they... reporting that shit and then getting the fuck away from it. Yeah, well, they brought it to the authorities. And it ended up being fifty eight hundred dollars, which, yeah, which is just which is just over seventeen thousand dollars in today's money. That's quite a bit. The FBI confirmed that these were in fact bills given to the hijacker of flight number three hundred five nine years previous because of the long ass serial numbers on each and every bill. Yes, because what they did is they took pictures of the bills and then copy that shit down, mm-hmm. and so they had copies and they had an actual list of it. They ended up returning 25 bills and some of the bits of the bills to the boy, Brian Ingram. They really did? Yeah, they did. They gave him some of it back. And like, oh, here's a little piece for you, kid. I feel like they wouldn't do that nowadays. I don't know. I don't think they would at all. Probably if you, not. If I found $17,000 in cash and I turned it over to the cops or the FBI, they wouldn't be like, oh, well, here's a thousand bucks for your trouble. They're well, like, no, no it sorry, this is all evidence. No, it wasn't like that. They they gave him some of the original bills back. They didn't just pay him off. They gave him like, oh, well, you can have some of these back. Right. I mean, that's they still wouldn't... weird because it's like evidence. Yeah, exactly. It's not like they caught the guy. Right. That's what I'm saying. I don't think I would get any back these days. I don't think they would just hand, you know, a portion of it back to me and be like, oh, well, here's here's where you trouble. They're, right. No. You know, here's some of the evidence. You just take that here's back some... with you. <laughs> you just go ahead and hold on to this evidence. Mm hmm. Except don't hold on to it because we're giving it to you, so feel free to spend it. If anyone even fucking take it. it, it I saw pictures of it. It looks haggard. Oh, yeah. That money was, like, rotted. Well, after the money was found, and they returned some of it, but they did call in a hydrologist to help out with the whole where the money had been situation. Mm-hmm. A hydrologist is a scientist that studies the movement, distribution, and quality of water. That's you kind of a weird job. Say. Yeah. With the name being hydrologist and all. Now they found. Although I was not aware of that orig- that actual title. Yeah, there you go. They discovered, or this guy, the scientist discovered that the money had only been at that location since 1974. Hmm. August, precisely. So he could tell you from whatever fucking magic he knows in his hydrology that. Well, how the river moves. 1974, and how- August. And they're like, sweet. So that'd be three years after Cooper's hijacking. They think it was either carried down river by a current or possibly planted there for some reason. Why you would plant 5800 5, bucks in some remote part of the Columbia River? Right, especially close to where you would have landed. I mean, I would think if you walked away from there, you would just be like, Audi. You're not going to go back like three years later and stick it in there. No. Because that that's when he said it would have gone into the... Wherever it was found. It's been yes, very, yes. Yes. Was it was three years after the hijacking. So and it was three years after the hijacking. Four so years before I wouldn't be it was like, found. You know, three years later, I'm going to return to the scene of the crime and I'm going to put some of the money. And next to the river? No, next just, to the river. Just on the off chance sense. that somebody might find these random three bundles of cash. That's just, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Well, as of last year, July 8th, 2016. The D.B. Cooper case is no longer being investigated by the FBI. So they say. They have, quote, redirected resources allocated to the D.B. Cooper case in order to focus on other investigative priorities, unquote. Between when the hijack occurred and this date, thousands of people were interviewed in relation to the case, and hundreds were considered serious suspects. None, however, were viable enough to actually charge. As with, I imagine, all cases, the authorities would hold back key bits of information and feed disinformation to the media in order to easily weed out anyone who may falsely admit to the crime. 
It's such a weird It makes sense, though. I mean... No, I mean, it makes sense to, to feed false Oh, I see what you're saying. To, that... to weed them out. It's just, it's weird when people confess to crimes that they didn't commit. I know, right? Like, that's just, I don't that's... get that shit. No, not at all. Like, I'm not confessing to shit. Like, stuff that I Especially did Especially something I didn't do. Right. Jesus Christ. That I'm going to get, like, a federal crime. Like, that's right. just not. Like, I totally fucking hijacked that thing. It sounds like, like a terrible mm, idea. That does sound like a terrible idea. Yeah. Like, why the fuck would you do that? People do some fucked up things for attention. I have actually they learned do. that. That's, that's the truth. Yes. Personally, recently. So, I mean, it's it's not a far stretch from some of the things I've seen firsthand. In 2007, the FBI disclosed that there were three DNA samples on the tie. Two small and one large. They just don't know who the DNA belongs to. and There's have yet no one to, f- to match it to. I haven't found a match yet. I see. And they've sampled lots of matches against it and haven't found one yet. If you're hearing this in your Rolls Royce, then Donald Trump's tax plan is for you. You're rich as hell. We're going to give you a tax cut? But for everyone else, there's Kamala Harris's plan. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a tax cut. Because that guy in the Ferrari doesn't need another break. But Kamala Harris knows you sure could use one. Paid for by FFPAC, FFPAC.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. They have Cooper's fingerprints from a magazine, a cigarette, and on parts of the plane, and have matched it against several suspects that it hasn't I bet that's how some of the people have gotten cleared, because you would think... Like, these aren't your fingerprints. Right. (laughs) Like... I, mean, I can't imagine the FBI not running Cooper's prints through a database once one existed, you know? Mm-hmm. And even so, in the I, 70s, I mean, that was like a primary thing because you didn't have DNA or anything back right, then. So right. you used fingerprints. And since this was actively being investigated for so long, one would expect that once there was more technology, mm-hmm. they, they would be running these fucking prints. But maybe he doesn't have a concealed weapons permit, hasn't been arrested, doesn't have a job that requires filing fingerprints. Yeah, I don't think I mean, my fingerprints are on file. Maybe so, now. Is it now, though? Don't don't you have to do it for, like, something? Like, your license or something? I don't think so. I feel like there's a scan of my fingerprint and my thumbprint somewhere now. It's possible. I don't know. They have my thumbprint. It's somewhere in a database. At work, I have to put... Well, I can. I don't. I just use my code. But I put a thumbprint to clock on and clock off. Yeah, so they can get a scan of your thumbprint. Oh, I'm sure they could. Mm-hmm. Although, for me, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because I don't go around committing crimes. If anything, it's probably helpful. So, like, if I get fucking murdered or something, like, kidnapped, like, maybe you could find my fingerprints somewhere, somewhere that I was, and then, you know, never find my body, and that's, like, the last... Just find your hands. Whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. In 2011, a woman claimed to have heard a couple of her uncles talking clandestinely about stuff and coming home one Thanksgiving all fucked up and battered from a quote-unquote car crash. Her parents had also made a couple offhand remarks about this particular uncle, whose name was L.D. Cooper. L.D. Cooper. Lynn Doyle Cooper was this fellow's name. <laughs> L.D. is. C. No, I was thinking of the Star Trek, The Voyage Home. It's Spock's acting weird, and freaking. Jim tries to tell the chick, I think he did a little too much <laughs> LDS in the 60s. Her father, before his death, also made a comment. Too much LDS. Don't you remember he hijacked that plane? To her in reference to LD. And her mother had commented to her that she thought LD was DB. There's too many initials in that whole deal. It's like something you'd, see, you'd read on a Facebook today. <laughs> Maybe. Too many fucking acronyms. I still, d- what does TRL mean? I don't know. Neither do I. Wait, what? 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 It's one I see a lot though, and I'm just like, do which? Oh, which one? T R L. Total request alive. I don't know. I don't internet very well. It makes me always think of Total Recall. That's what I think when I see that one. But we'll yeah. go with that. We'll go with Total Total Recall. Yeah. See, also her uncle L D was way into the Dan Cooper comic book. He had one tacked to his wall. Oh, interesting. And it seems like that's not a very well known comic. Not, not, or it didn't used to be. I'm sure it's a little bit more well known now. Because wasn't it like a foreign comic? Yeah, it was from Canada. Oh well, it was a okay. French Canadian one. So it was a Fr- so was it in French? Yes. So that's at weird. the time it was not. It had not been 
translated into English. It's been translated into English now. Right. And so. But back then you would have had to be a pretty avid comic book collector. I would think if you had fucking French comics. Probably. But that was comic books were big in the 70s. So. Well, yeah, because I mean, there was no fucking Internet and shit. Yeah, there was no Internet. People probably didn't even know about fucking tulpas. I'm sure some people did. There weren't any bronies because there was no My Little Pony. Right. Well, maybe in the by the eighties there was My Little Pony. There was an original cartoon when I was growing up of it. I'm you not sure know... if that spawned bronies. <laughs> no, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is what spawned bronies. Yes. And my girls were watching that in the car the other day when we were going home from somewhere with Jarek, I think from the football game. And they were talking about something going on and he's like, Oh, I can't believe that and and then he made some comment about like bronies i'm like how the fuck do you know about bronies he's like chow mom everyone knows about bronies <laughs> and i'm like i only knew about them because of the episode on tulpas that we did and that stuff is totally weird and whatever and he's like you want to know weird he's like do you want to know what clopping is and i said okay what's clopping clopping is masturbating while watching my little pony <laughs> Also known in the Bronin community, and I would just like to take this moment to point out to you that I fucking told you that shit was perverted. All right. Clopping. It's an actual thing. That my 16 year old son knew about and I totally fucking didn't. That's funny. Yeah. Bronies and clopping. And I told you that was some weird perverted shit. (laughs) Well, there's people put weird perverted shit into literally everything. This is true. This is true. But I mean, My Little Pony is just weird. Hey, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, well, and so back then, okay, yeah, lots of comic books, people could like comic It just still seems like an odd one. It seems it like is, something. It is definitely an odd one. It's, you, you'd really have to be, it's more than your like Archie and whatever shit and Batman and all the other stuff. And now it was a. general like teenager or young adult male, most likely in the 70s would have yeah. in their collection. Yeah. It would be kind of a strange one. Well, this woman, Marla Cooper is her name. She sent a guitar strap her uncle had made to the FBI for testing, but none of the DNA found on the tie matched that of the guitar strap. Most cases I read about, people who others thought could be Dan Cooper either were ruled out by DNA, alibi, or incorrect information regarding the case. Yeah, I have one. It doesn't say how he was ruled out, but it was an interesting one because he was an attendant for that particular airline that he'd hijacked. Oh, really? Yeah. And his name was uh, Kenneth Christensen. And he, I, what was it called? Like New Orient or something? The Northwest Orient, I Northwest believe. Orient. So he was a flight attendant there and I guess kind of had an issue with his employer. And I guess one year after the skyjacking, he purchased a home in Southern Washington in cash. Huh. He paid cash for this house, but he only made like 150 bucks a week. I don't know what that is in 1970s salary, but. Or in today's salary, rather. Right. You know, but it was unusual. It would have been kind of unusual for him to have saved that amount of money at his job with the airline in that amount of time or. I don't know what he ha- what he did before that, but for some reason it, it seemed odd that he would have had that much money in order to pay it, just straight up pay cash for a house. Was he investigated? He was, I mean, he was investigated. His name's no popped up, but obviously something cleared him or they didn't have anything on him. It so... is interesting though that he also, he smoked. He was a smoker. He drank bourbon. Well, I mean, come on. I mean, but... A smoker that drank bourbon in the 70s? You shut your mouth. And $150 a week is, in today's currency, $885. Right. So that's more money than I make. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little bit, but not that much. Lucky. I'm not going to be saving up and buying a house straight up cash on that amount of, no, you know... No, no. Maybe if it was... If the houses cost as much as they did in the 70s. <laughs> True. And it was, it was South Washington, Southern Washington. Oh, yeah. In the so it's probably not overly so expensive. Probably there not either. overly expensive, but still, it would take me a long time. I mean, even if I was like buying something that was like $20,000. Like, oh, yeah. It would take me a long time to save that. Yeah. I, I know. So it, it just seemed improbable that he would have saved that much money. And also, he resembled him 
so much that one of the stewardesses said that that was the closest that she'd seen that she'd seen to what he looked like when oh, they crazy. showed his but they photo. Found, did he have a, he had, must have had an alibi or something. He must have had something, but it was enough where it was like, yeah, that's weird. Match. He worked for the airline. He was an attendant. So he would have kind of known about the plane and the flight paths. And yeah. Yeah. Had that information. And he just one year later, straight up buys a house in cash. And maybe they cleared the cash somehow because I if guess he used they got his all, ransom cash. Then they would have been like, hey these numbers match this list right i'm sure that's how they cleared it because probably if but it's it cleared prob- then but back then it probably took a while for probably, the bank records yeah. to to do that because that wasn't like computerized or anything i don't think back whenever this Unlikely. guy was investigated i think it was close to when the crime occurred because yeah one year later he bought the house in cash and i think that's what made people a little bit you know, put the radar up on this yeah, guy because yeah. it was he lived in the area. He worked there, and then a year later buys a house in cash, and it probably just took for fucking ever. See, what do they call that? Circumstantial tra- evidence. Yeah, yeah. They had for they them had to a- trace it through the bank and wait for the numbers to come back. And like, oh shit! It's like, well, I'm sure that all the FBI agents that were assigned to this had photocopies and could just look right but i mean what the guy paid i mean in the bank records on that end like to confirm like did is the cash that you got in the bank for the sale i'm sure the bank the same as what we have pictures of i'm sure the banks because since they got the money from local banks i'm Mm -hmm. sure the banks are probably in the loop too yeah they they got it from see first bank but they're like hey hold on a second still i bet it was a i bet it was a process Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. It I mean, certainly wasn't easy today, today. That takes, you know. I mean, Seconds. you got want to get a fucking passport. You got to wait like six goddamn months, and everything's on the computer. It's like just, just do it. Just do it. Just give me my shit. See, also in April 2013, police were called to a Woodenville, Washington home by a woman saying she'd found her father dead. She hadn't heard from him for a couple of days and went to his house to check on him. This man was Earl Cossey. As mentioned before. Yes, my teacher. He was also the man who packed and owned the three working parachutes delivered to Dan Cooper. He was killed by being hit on the head with something. He was beaten to death, essentially. Probably during a burglary. Except that nothing was really seemed to be missing from the house, is how I read it. I didn't read if anything was missing from the house. Did you read about how his... Well, his wallet and stuff were taken, and somebody anonymously mailed it back. Interesting. To the house. So the daughter, so he dies like April 23rd, 2013. And we're talking like Woodenville, Washington. Let me tell you, like, no one fucking gets murdered in Woodenville like ever. It is a small town, uh, an affluent town. It's just one of those, it's just like the ultimate definition of like suburbia. But yeah, it's it's just not a place where like murder happens. It's a nice suburban area. Mm-hmm. It's a very nice suburban area. But murder literally never happens there, and it well, it is not still, literally, obviously, because well, obviously, it happens once in a while. But I can't even think of another murder. There was offhand. that homeless guy that got beaten to death. Yeah. But that was regardless, very few murders. Mm-hmm. And there's been a couple of, you know, teachers, other teachers that ended up getting murdered. But that was, like, from high school. And they actually lived in, like, other places. They didn't live in Woodenville, like Mr. Causey. Yes. So he was 74 when he was killed. Now, according to Causey, every few years, the FBI would bring up some old bits of parachute and ask him if it was the ones Cooper took. And it never was. Right. I have his, like, actual quote about it because he was a little bit snarky and it's weird i read this article about this guy who is basically trying to say that mr Cosy was like full of shit and that he didn't actually uh own the shoots or take them to the airport as he had claimed to the media that he had only packed them but i never heard that he took them to the airport in the first place he didn't the cops picked them up at the so i can't find any any instance where he made that claim. Well, I know that, see, on one April Fool's Day, he uh, some reporter called him about right. one of the parachute pieces. And he and told he had him. And he said that it was D.B. Cooper's because, as like an April Fool's joke. And, and the that reporter wasn't very, got like, fired. <laughs> Did he get fired? I thought that yeah. they just said that they, they no, he, could have gotten fired. No, he wrote a, wrote a report about it and they got fired for it being a false, or wrote a story about it and got fired for it being a false story. Well, that is unfortunate. 
right? So maybe so, maybe he did lie to them, quote unquote, because he was sick of people constantly calling him. And so maybe it was an April Fool's Day and he had a sense of humor. So he used that sense of humor. He said he was getting mixed reviews over the incident is what Mr. Kazi is said. Uh, is reported to have said, but I'm having fun with it. What the, what the heck? Yeah. Ah, what the heck? Yeah. I honestly... What he quoted, what, what he said about um, the FBI and the ongoing investigation is he says, they keep bringing me garbage, Kazi told the Associated Press in 2008. Uh, and this is after they had brought him part of a, a shoot in 2008 yeah that and this is this is this guy's problem with with mr kazi is that he i think he thinks there's more to the shoot than what the fbi is letting on oh that mr kazi said that it wasn't it so he said every time they find squat they bring it out and open their trunk and say is that it and then i say nope go away and then a few years later they come back so he they brought the parachute to him he said no that's not it and they're like okay whatever and so this guy that doesn't like Mr. Kazi or thinks that he's lying is Robert Blevins. And he thinks there's a lot more to this parachute that was found in 2008 than what the FBI is letting on. And that the reason Mr. Kazi would have said that it wasn't the shoot was he didn't want to get caught uh, lying about huh. his relationship to the parachutes. Okay. All this time. So yeah, I mean, I did. I admit to just skimming through this guy's article because it was right, surprisingly just, wordy. Like Jesus Christ, there man, is. Really? I think there is a twenty-seven minute YouTube on it God that damn. the same guy did, and then there is like this WordPress blog that this so guy he's very did passionate about, about this. He's very passionate about the parachute issue and wow. Mr. Kazi and all of that, but even all that stuff, none of it really actually ties the crime to db cooper it is just i would say really fucking weird so that thing with his id so yeah he's found april 23rd oh no he dies april 23rd and he's found april 26th by his daughter and they know that the uh letter was processed through the ever post office and it was processed in between the day that he died and the day that his daughter found him so it was mailed sometime in those three days interesting yeah and it just uh apparently it had a handwritten note but i couldn't it's probably an evidence like what the Likely, note says because yeah. i couldn't find anything as to what the note actually said other than it was a handwritten note and his id and bank cards and just other cards that you would have in his wallet was in this envelope so i guess the theory is is that maybe whoever beat him to death took his wallet and then dropped the stuff out of it maybe because i don't think it was his actual wallet i think it was just all the stuff that would be in his just, wallet so maybe he just took cash out of there because i mean the, the bank cash card that's, that's kind of weird but you know well, whatever yeah, but you can't track cash you can track yeah. a bank card and there's cameras everywhere and even in 2013 there were cameras everywhere yes i so, mean this is pretty recent it's, it's still it's interesting that it's still unsolved though I oh mean, yeah I mean, I don't think it really had anything to do with the Cooper case. I don't think it did either. It's, it's just, just it's a, just unusual just because they're, like I said, I mean, there's very, like, murder, like, never happens in Wendell. Yes, so, it is weird. It's So it's weird for it to have happened, to have happened to him in particular, and for it to be unsolved. Like, a random, they can't figure out any motive for it because other than maybe whatever cash he had in his wallet, nothing else was taken. Well, fuck, maybe the guy... Broke into the house, didn't expect someone to be home. Someone was he, like, home, surprised freaked somebody. out, smashed him in the head. Took his wallet. Took his wallet and left. Ran off and yeah. left. It's just Ditched the wallet someplace, kept right. the wallet with the cash in it and ditched the insides or whatever. Probably just a really random crime. It again, probably was. It's just a sad, shitty thing People don't break into a happened. lot of other people. You know, there's not yeah. even a lot of break-ins. There's just like hardly any crime in general. Right, right. More recently, in fact, this year, 2017, an LA TV and film producer, Tom Colbert, found a nylon strap from a parachute he believes belonged to Dan Cooper. The strap did match that of the type of parachute that was used by the hijacker. In conversations with the FBI, Colbert told him the location where it was found. He kept that a secret from the press, just to keep it on the down low, and who he thought D.B. Cooper really was. A man named Robert Rackstraw. And this is a man name. the FBI ruled him out years ago. Interesting. 
And the hijacking of Northwest number 305 is the only unsolved airplane hijacking in America. Wow. Well, that's pretty much all I have about Dan Cooper. Well, what is your theory? Do you think that he lived and got away with it, or do you think he died? Well, since there's absolutely no evidence either way, it's hard to say. It is hard to say. This one is one where I, you know, neither one would really surprise me. No, not really. I would be, I mean, pretty much. Because basically, if you went to some other country with that cash in 1971... You're good. You're good. You can go down to Mexico, South America. You can, and you can use all that cash, and that cash is not going to be traceable by U.S. federal agents in the United mm-hmm. States. No way. With their no way Stone Age no way. way of you know you go down tracking you, serial numbers on cash. Go down to South America and trade it in for their money down there, or just right, use it as is, and yeah, you are and good. You're to just go. good living on a beach. You already got the sunglasses. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So, but he also may have died. He also may have died. I mean, it However, was I feel, shitty conditions, and, and to this day, that area is pretty, pretty thick. So I don't. It's I don't very know if they would thick. Still run if they would run there into a body. There is still plenty of places you can hide bodies and out there. With the whole Mount St. Helens erupting thing, that right, so a lot I mean, like got covered in ash and all sorts of and mudslides and just all sorts of shiz. That I feel like if we ever find the body of Dan Cooper, it'll be hundreds of years in the future doing some development of the land and it'll just happen right. upon a corpse. Right. Or he has like, kind of like Richard the third. Yeah, exactly. Like we need a, uh, like we need a carport. Like, we oh, need a garage. Shit, there's a, a body. Garage. Like, Oh fuck. Here's a goddamn body. I, you know what? I bet you it's this guy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that'll probably be how it happened. Or he could be in the ocean because the Columbia river, I saw something where some, river expert they weren't called a hydrologist but they probably weren't as cool yeah but they did say that anybody in the columbia river would probably be spewed out into the ocean that was the term used spewed into the ocean within a matter of days actually i almost feel like if he is dead that maybe that is what happened to his body that it's it's probably long gone we might not even find it building a parking garage unless we build ones underwater maybe maybe it'll be part of that reality show we're gonna have going on with the uh, underwater maybe (laughs) building things (laughs) and cooking (laughs) and cooking (laughs) underwater cooking so i don't know yeah i i neither one would surprise me neither scenario would surprise me but i do think if he's dead that probably we're never gonna find his body is what i would imagine that's probably the case and we wouldn't know it anyway because he's not gonna pop up his damn motherfucking cooper right (laughs) That would be interesting if you got some weird, like, deathbed confession from some faraway place. Like, oh, by the way. I think we would have got it by now. He'd be pretty old. God, was the 70s like that long ago? That's just fucking, I hate that. I still think of, like, the 70s as, like, 30 years ago. It was not 30 years ago? It was not. It was not at all. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Take care now. Oh, hey there. I didn't see you. I'm Sarah, the host of the Salty Canadian Podcast. You want a podcast that is full of fun, rants, reviews, and just random stuff? Then this is a podcast for you. We can be found on any podcast catcher. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And have a great day. A- Do you enjoy the Stranger Than podcast? Please let us know. Rate and comment on iTunes. Check out and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash stranger than podcast. Our Twitter at underscore stranger than or drop us an email stranger than podcast at gmail.com. That's stranger than podcast, all one word at gmail.com. Also, feel free to email us any strange, mysterious or misunderstood stories or topic suggestions that you'd like to share or hear about.